What's up, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only James Williams. I'm back with another interview. For me, I hate when I belch, but I just drunk some water. Y'all got to forgive me. I'm back with Eric from the Uncomfortable Podcast, Eric Solenji. And we're going to be talking about his encounters and everything that he's encountered, which based on what we just talked about in the pre-interview, I'm just going to tell you, bro, we're talking about insanity, bro. I know some of y'all are looking for some comedy and jokes. We'll do some of that later on today, but right now we're talking serious. And by the way, I want you people to understand, there's no either or. Just because you crack jokes doesn't mean that you can't be serious and that you don't have credibility. Only a foolish person would say that one side of a man's personality dictates his whole life. That That's crazy, but that's some of the things that I want to point out in this field because it just doesn't make any sense. I don't, I don't know where you guys get these concepts and ideas from. You know what I'm saying? Michael Jordan was more than just a basketball player. He was a baseball player. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I don't know where y'all get it from. But anyway, I'm bringing Eric in. We're about to have some fun. Let's go. Eric, what's up, my man? How you feeling today? Doing really well, James. Thanks for having me on. Feeling great. So thanks, for, thanks for spending some time with me, man. I want to start where I always start. And then I think I'm going to do a little word association. Then we're going to really get off to the races. All right. All right. I'm always interested in this, Eric. When and at what point in time in your life, if you look back over your life, going in retrospect, when would you say that you took first took interest in the weird, strange, woo type stuff? What happened that brought you into the awareness that this actually exists? I can tell you for a fact. And, and I have something base, to base that timeline on. I was born in 1965. I'm 58. I'm going to be 59 in June. In 1970, a movie came out called, or a pseudo-documentary came out. It was called Chariots of the Gods. It was based on Eric Van Donneken's ancient alien type theory. So this movie came out, and at five years old, I was already obsessed with UFOs to the point where I begged and pleaded with my parents to take me to see it and they wouldn't do it. I ended up convincing my grandma while she was babysitting me to take me to see that film. And I can remember sitting at the McKinley theater and she was sitting to the right of me. And I remember looking over, there were pictures of the, the Nazca lines and different crop circles and stuff like that. And I looked over at my grandma and she was out cold snoring, drool coming out of her mouth. And I, I can remember being five years old and thinking, how can you be sleeping through this? This is amazing. So at five, I was firmly rooted in UFOs. It's never left me. And I've never once not believed that they were a real thing. My, my belief has changed in what they are rather than being from other galaxies and traversing space to get here. I don't think that's the case anymore, but I never wavered in my belief that they existed and, you know, whether we believe our government or not, the world's governments have said now in the past three, four or five years, uh, you, the UK has been saying it for a lot longer than that, that these things are real and there, there is cause for investigation. But then that prompted me into, in grade school, taking a book out of the library. And the first half of the book was about Bigfoot. And the second half of the book was about the Loch Ness Monster. Those two were gateway drugs into then later on, it was a Bermuda Triangle and so on and so on. And it really, it culminated with a couple of odd experiences I had as a late teen prior to my dad's death. And then I had some significant experiences, some interactions with what I can only assume was my dad. And it started about nine months after he had been killed, uh, hit, but hit and killed by a car. Those instances solidified for me that this stuff is real and I don't need anybody's commentary on it to dissuade me or to make me think that it's not real because that experience, I'm not prone to, I'm not prone to making things up. I'm not a, I don't hallucinate. I don't do drugs. I'm not a, an alcoholic. I don't even drink hardly at all. So these experiences that I had and the things that they were related to here in, in the house that I grew up with him, it just, it really solidified for me that this stuff is real. And I had some more experiences a little later on in life. And about three years ago, I decided to start doing uncomfortable podcasts. And it was, I wanted to provide a safe space for people to come on and talk about their experiences. I'm knowledgeable about a lot of this stuff because I've been into it for as the majority of my life. So I can carry on a very good cohesive conversation 
with people about their experiences. And I, I had a conversation with Tony from the confessionals. And that was the first time that I ever came out and said, I've had this, I've had that, I've had this, I've had that. And when you say it all out loud and, and I don't blame anybody for looking at me and saying, man, dude, you're crazy as a freaking loon. Nobody has that kind of stuff happen. I'm here to tell you I've, I have, and that's why I do what I do because I put up with trying to tell people about this stuff and I get the eye rolls and I get the, you're crazy or quit making stuff up. So I like to give a platform to people who have had experiences to come on the show, talk about it in a genuine conversation. Let's try to get to the bottom of it. Sometimes I like to try to dig and maybe pull out some information from them that, that they aren't even aware of. And it, it, I had a conversation with Kyle and Steve from hollow sky podcast, and they used the term sin eater. And I know that sin eater comes from the Constantine comic book and Keanu Reeves movie, but it literally is to some extent, that's a pretty good analogy because I have had, I have had experiences that have been a result of conversations that I've had where I've either seen or felt things because of the person that I've been talking to. And it, it does seem to be that there's times where I get off of a, a 90 minute or two hour interview and I can talk for hours, man. I can talk and talk. It doesn't bother me, but I've gotten off of interviews before and I am drained absolutely just, and I can't explain there's something drawing energy from you. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think, why do you think, man, I, I, maybe I'm just not in the mood to go there, but why do you think, why do you think you feel drained when you have those conversations? And I want you to, after you answer that, I want you to circle back and take me back to what happened as a teenager. Cause you glossed over it, but something tells me that was very significant. Why do you think? I, I believe it was. There's part of me that feels that this is going to sound arrogant and I don't know how to say it in a way that is not going to be arrogant, but I feel that like it took me 50 years, 50 plus years to figure out what my purpose is. And my purpose is I have a voice, both literal and figuratively. So either that drain is coming from good spirit who is helping me get through and try to impart some wisdom or some uh, help or positiveness towards positivity towards the person that I'm talking to, or I'm dealing with the negative, the battling, the negative that's coming from the person that I'm talking to. I, I've not, I think, to be honest with you, I think I've had both. That, I think that's the best I can answer. It, it is because I don't gloss over things when I'm talking to people. I don't, if there's some, if they say something significant, I want to delve into it. I want to know the, the reasons and the questions. That's where they come from. I think I've been affected by both. I'll say this. I'll say from my experience, it's because when you get into people's stories that have demonic influences, angelic influences, both good and bad, Bigfoot dog, man. Well, most people don't understand you are in spiritual warfare because everything in the realm of the spirit, when they come to you, there's an, those entities are there with them in that spirit realm. And so you're sitting there engaging with that person. And the more you dig, I said this in a pre-interview, the more you dig and the more you pull out your shovel and you're digging, in your mind, you're digging to get them a solution. You're trying to help them, right? Your intent is to help them. But these things standing behind them don't want them to be helped because they own them in that spirit realm. And so you're sitting there literally fighting a battle. And if you don't have, if your spirit man is not armored, protected, and probably strong, super strong, then you get drained. Now, I'll tell you this. If you go look at people who are in this field who are paranormal creators, you notice all of them gray real fast and real early. Yep. They age extremely fast. I Just still get that. This is all natural yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you'll see that they all gray. The reason why they gray is because spirit is stronger than flesh 
And the more time you deal with spirits and spirits are around you, your body starts to age from dealing with it. You mentioned Tony earlier. Tony's a cool guy. Shout out to big Tony Merkel. I love Tony. Tony's phenomenal. Back in the day, we did this roundtable discussion. I this remember that. Six I, years ago, bro. Yep, and that was back in the days when nobody wanted to talk about the spiritual warfare aspects of this stuff. Nobody, Tony and I would have, really were the only two talking about it. And I was saying then about the warfare that I was going through. And over time, I've learned these lessons that no, this ain't, there's probably 30% of this, this that's natural flesh and blood. The rest of it is all spiritual. And so when you're engaging in these with these people, you're engaging in spiritual warfare. And it's just purely it. People won't accept it. But you'll even see it, Eric, in the behavior patterns of those who are investigators that go out into the woods on a consistent basis. When you talk to their wives, they'll go to the woods looking for Bigfoot. They'll come back angry. And their wives will say, James, I need you to pray for such and such because he's been going to the woods every day and he's coming back and being belligerent and being violent and being angry. And this is not my husband. So when you get together and you pray with him, it pops off of him. Pow! And he's like, what the hell, man? What happened? No, no, bro. You're going and you're gathering spirits and bringing them back into your household. So it, it gets wild. But for people like me and you, let's say in the course of a year, you have 100 conversations. Bro, you literally button in the spiritual business of 100 different people with 100 different things attached to them. And all of those things are pissed off. Every last one of them. They're like, oh, no, we're going to mess him up. We're going to destroy him. Eric, man, I got another question for you. So let me go here. All right. Let's talk about guests. You've been in the podcast business for a while. It's been yes, sir. in the podcast business. What's been probably the scariest podcast guest you've had? Who's, who's that been? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so hands down, um, my fifth episode. <clears throat> wasn't wasn't my fifth episode recording in uh, chronological order but it's the fifth episode that i let release um i had a I had a gentleman reach out to me uh through messenger or something and he suggested he's like hey i know a uh, a witch that i think would be a really good fit for your show this guy started listening to me like within my first two or three episodes right. i had like 10 listeners <laughs> and uh so he facilitated the invitation, uh, the introduction and, um, <clears throat> her name was Susan. She was a, she was a witch, um, but she was native American. He made like, he made it clear that she was native American. So in my head, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to come up with, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm trying to come up with a reason for people want to listen to this episode. Right. Uh, right. Hook a catchy name for the episode. And I was like, um, dinner with a witch date night with a witch. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I contacted her and she agreed to do the interview, I found out that she was only like 30 minutes away from me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at that time I had not had a whole lot of experience yet. And I was willing to go to any lengths to get an interview, to get this thing going. So I tried to make it easier for her. And I said, you know, I can come, I can meet you because like this stuff, stream yard and stuff i wasn't aware of it yet right um, so i said you know i can bring my equipment to your house and you know we can do it right there in the comfort of your home and she took me up on it so we set the date for for the recording and in the interim i was thinking it's like all right how am i going to come up you know it's like so i came up with date night with a witch mm -hmm. and and I, I ran it past my son and my son's kind of like always the voice of reason for me and and he's like he's like i don't know man he's like if you do that then you know you might get labeled as like a a, a misogynist or you know this you know he's like I, I wouldn't do the whole like taking somebody on a date he's, he's like people are weird nowadays and that might just be enough to kind of shoot yourself in the foot right 
my goal was I was going to say, hey, let's go out to dinner before we record. That way, you know, that'll be my thanks for you doing the show. I'll buy your dinner. It'll give uh, us a chance to get acquainted and and talk a little bit. It wasn't like a date date. It was just, all right, I gotcha. you know, and uh, and he convinced me not to do it. So the day of the uh, the day of the interview shows up and on the way home, I stop by McDonald's. I get myself a Big Mac and a nice big extra large Coke. And, you know, I eat my food and get my stuff packed up and put it in the car and I'm backing out of the driveway and my phone dings and I look and it's a message from her and she says, have you eaten? And I was like, yeah, I have. I Now, let me reiterate by saying I never brought it up with her as far as going to dinner and doing a date. Right. That was, that was the idea. idea. That was just the idea. And I said, yeah, I said, actually, I already have eight. And she's like, oh, darn, in the, the message to me. And I said, listen, if you need to back it up a half hour so it gives you time to get something to eat, you know, I didn't know, I, you know, maybe she got out of work late or whatever. I'm like, I'm flexible. You know, if you need some time, she goes, oh, I really wanted to go get something to eat. And I was like, well, listen, I said, I'll go with you. I said, you know, I've already ate, but, you know, I'll have a drink and we can we can have conversation and get acquainted. Right. So I went to pick her up and I get to the house and the the, the second she opens the door. This is going to make me sound like a really bad person. But there was this, uh, um, there was this attraction. Of course her. it was. Okay. So there was this attraction to her. And it, dude, when I tell you, it made me feel bad because like that attraction was unnatural to me. It was, it was, it was nothing more than animalistic. Mm -hmm. And she came out, <clears throat> I went over, I was a gentleman. I opened up the door for her. We got in the car and she said it was like about a 20 minute drive to where this little hole in the wall bar that she was going to take us to. So we go driving down the road and we get into this curve and there's like the guardrail that goes around through the curve. Well, right behind that guardrail going back into the woods was a, a clear cut. And she says, oh, ooh, ooh, pull over here real quick. Just pull over. So I pulled over in front of the guardrail. She opens the door. She says, roll your window down. So I rolled the passenger door window down. She stands out there and she looks into the woods and she puts her hands up like this and she goes, ooh. And I'm like, what the fuck is she doing? And off in the distance, I hear, Ooh. and I was like, <laughs> she looks in the window and she goes, isn't that cool? And I said, yeah. And she goes, that's where my big boy lives. And I said, your big boy. And she goes, yeah, SETI. And I said, SETI, you know, and I'm thinking search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Right. And she's like, no, SETI is uh, an Egyptian name. Right. And, and I was like, okay. So she gets back in the car and we, we drive down a couple of roads and she goes, Oh, that's where the house where I grew up at. That's where my mom lived. And that's the little garden where I used to play with the, uh, the fairies. And, and I'm like, Oh man, what did I do here? Yeah, what did I get myself into? Yeah. And so then, you know, it's 10 minutes, 10 more minutes. We get to this little bar, we sit down, She's a tiny little thing. And, you know, she orders a steak and she orders fries. And I think she ordered mushrooms. And I'm like, good Lord, man, where are you putting all this stuff? You know, I don't know that I could have finished all that. Right. I had a, I had one drink, an old fashioned. And uh, she gets done eating. We get the bill and the, the lady, you know, the waitress comes to leave the bill at the, at the table and she, I, I just grabbed it immediately. I said, I got it. You know, this is my thanks for doing the interview. And it was $46. Even. No penny oh. cents, no nothing. It was just 46.00. And I was like, man, I don't know that I've ever bought anything that was, that was $46. Even. No, no taxes, you know, no, right. no extra pennies here or there. So it 
what it was kind of odd, but it wasn't necessarily weird, right? So we get back in the car, we drive back to her house, and it's starting to get to be about dusk. Um, we go down these all these back roads and stuff, and I'm completely turned around and have no idea where the hell I'm at. And she says, take a left here, and we take a left, and boom, we're right back at her house. So I pull in the driveway, grab all my equipment, we're taking it into the house, and you know her property is wooded, um, it's right off a road, Across mm-hmm. the street is just big, wide open field. Uh, there's you ever go past a farm and you see the farmer field, but there's like a, a acre or maybe a half acre of trees that they never cut down. Yep. I've always wondered what the hell is that? You know, is that just for wildlife or was there something about that area that they decided they weren't going to pull the trees up? I still, I have no idea why that is, but she had one of those in front of her house, you know, maybe a hundred yards off the road in the middle of this field. And we walked in the house and I assumed we were going to set up like on the kitchen table or dining room table or, you know, she's like, oh, come on, let's go upstairs. So she took me up this narrow hallway. And I mean, literally, I mean, I'm a pretty broad guy, but I had to turn sideways and hold my suitcase and and my equipment bag, you know, sideways to get up this really narrow stairway. And we get up to the top of the stairway and there's a door on the right-hand side. And it's got like a, I don't know if it was necessarily a dog man, but it was like a oil painting poster of like a werewolf. Mm -hmm. And uh, she opens the door and she, she like, go ahead, go in. And I walked in. And and I'm standing in her bedroom. And I'm like, you know, this whole time, that that whole animalistic thing that I'm telling you, it, 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 let me say, say this. She was not my type at mm-hmm. all. You know, nothing derogatory towards her, but she just simply was not my type. Right. Um, but I had this, like, unnatural animalistic drive towards her and now she's got me in her bedroom and it's it's a fairly fairly good sized room the back wall of the bedroom was all windows facing out at that field that had the trees in the little island of trees um and you know so she she sets up this card table in front of me and i put my mics on there and i got my roadcaster kind of off to the side and i i had some other stuff stacked on a box of Mountain Dew and it was like really haphazard. I'm like, Oh my God, how am I going to get a good recording out of this? And, uh, and she closes the door and I'm sitting in a chair that the door is, is right here to my, to my left-hand side and the doorknob is right by my shoulder. Right. So I'm sitting there and we start the, uh, we start the interview and, Things are going good. Very interesting woman. She's able to trace her family lineage on her mom's side all the way back to the Druids in in the UK, and she can uh, her her grandfather's her dad's 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 side. Her great great grandfather uh, was Chief Cornstalk, who you know has a lot to do with the um, Point Place in West Virginia, mm-hmm. and he was married to. Uh, I forget what Pocahontas's sister. She he was married to her. Um, you know, could have been making it up. Could have been completely real. I don't know. I've never turned my DNA in to find out who or right. where I come from. And I'm looking around the room as we're talking, and you know, there's there's dream catchers, and there's uh, you know, carvings of uh, black bear, and there's you know, a picture of Loki. The the uh, Norse uh, God and you know, there's werewolf stuff. And uh, I mean, it was, it was relatively spooky, you know, but it was spooky in the sense of like, it, she was trying to be spooky. You know, that's right. like, she probably liked that kind of stuff. She probably loved Halloween and really decorated and, and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Uh, so we sat there and we started talking and she was going into some really neat stuff about her, her family history. And then she kind of started getting into, 
I, I assumed that she was a Native American witch in the sense of being like a shaman or a medicine woman or something like that. She was literally a witch uh, in the sense of what we would consider a witch. Mm -hmm. And she went on to, you know, admit that she she doesn't really stray away or stay away from dabbling in the in the gray and black magic uh, if if deemed necessary. Mm -hmm. um, then she went on to tell me, you know, like somebody had been messing with a, a cousin of hers and was just treating her really bad. And her and her coven had had put something on this man and he ended up vomiting blood for like three days had to go to the hospital hospital could never could figure out where it was coming from or why it was happening um and then they called it off and you know he basically left the girl alone and apparently went on to live his life hopefully um <laughs> but then we started talking about how she, there was a ghost in that house and she said that there was a uh, an older african american woman who had lived in that house and she sees her th pass through her bedroom uh, almost as if it was like at one point in time the the bedroom wasn't there and maybe that was a hall or something right and she's saying this i knew she had told me that <clears throat> her brother lived in, <coughs> excuse me that her brother had lived in the house as well and I didn't see him when we came in, but as I'm sitting here talking to her, I see this hand reach in like off my left hand shoulder and I see this like waves. And it, you know, I mean, I see the arm from, you know, mid forearm to the hand and it's uh -huh. just a quick wave like that. And I, I assumed that's her brother saying, Hey, I'm here. I'm not going to interrupt you, but just letting you know right. I'm here. Um, and as she's talking about this ghost lady and, and I, I just kind of, I glanced over and the, the door is closed. And as I told you, the, the door knob, was right beside right my shoulder. if I, if that door would have opened, it would have had to open into the room and I would certainly would have seen it. So I'm like, Holy shit. Did I just see a ghost hand come through the door is as she's talking about this lady ghost in her home is she like it wasn't directed at me it was directed at her like she was waving at her yeah like hey i hear you're talking about me you know here i am um and i was i was like holy crap man i mean again I, you know i think i said this before we started recording i'm not prone to making shit up i'm not i don't hallucinate i don't drink i'm not i'm not a i'm not a drunk anyway um so I was like, holy shit, I think I just saw a ghost hand. And, uh, you know, it was, it was cool and it was kind of unnerving a little bit. And, um, conversation continued and, uh, she, she got to a point where she was in the middle of a sentence and she said the word and, and at the very end of the word and there was this massive bombastic absolutely deafening oh, i mean just it was insane and she whipped around to look at the windows i was already looking in the direction of the windows i pulled my earphone off and she looked back at me and she goes did you hear that and i was like hell yes i heard that what the hell was that and she goes that's him and i'm like that's who and she said, that's the big boy, that's Seti. And I'll tell you that, like, as I was sitting there, as that was happening, the every every hair on my body stood up. I don't care where it was. My torso, my legs, my toes, everything was just standing straight up. And then it kind of it kind of started to dissipate. But then it came back. I didn't hear it again, but that that staticky feeling that my hair standing up, it came back again, only it wasn't quite as strong. And then it kind of faded off and then it came back again, only it wasn't as uh, apparent as it was the time before. And it did that like four or five times. And I was like, what in the hell is going on? And she said, you know, he heard me talking about him. And, you know, so I'm like, I, I, I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, you know, I had experience with, talking to people about Bigfoot. I have some things that happened that I think might've been Bigfoot uh, out while I was hunting, but I was like, 
what in the hell? I have no idea what I just experienced. All I know is my body, when that happened, the, I had two thoughts that run through my head. First one was, fuck, I left my car, my gun in my car. And the, sec- <laughs> and the second thought immediately following that says, shit, I got 40 pounds of dog food in my back seat. <laughs> I mean, like, what a, what a weird thought, right? You know? <laughs> what kind of coincidence is you got 40 uh, pounds of dog food in the back You know, because I had gone and bought dog food for my dog before the interview, and I didn't take it out before I left to go interview her. And uh, so I'm like, you know, it took us a while to get past that. But then I was like, oh, my God, you know, I've got I've got a roadcaster here. I've got really good microphones. That was so loud that I heard it through my hear my headphones, not coming through the mic, but I heard it in spite of having headphones on. And I'm like, I know that my equipment picked that up and I could not wait to get home and put that on the computer so I could isolate that that moment mm-hmm. and so i clapped really loud so that i could when i pulled the the wave file up on, on wave file. i could see where i could see where that clap happened and i knew it would be a minute or two before that right so then you know we we kind of got our bearings back again and we continued with the uh the conversation and it, it got to the it got to the end of the night and um i had I started to pack all my stuff up and we weren't recording anymore. And, uh, she was sitting across from me now on the edge of her bed. She was sitting there. She had her legs crossed. She already had a, like a car length leather coat on, um, just waiting for me to get my stuff packed up and she was going to walk me out. And, uh, I, I looked up at her and, <laughs> Dude, she went from being 45, 46, 47 years old with a leather coat on, brown leather coat, kind of a wine color, I guess, and blue jeans. You, you know what a you know what an etch a sketch is? Mm-hmm. You ever you ever look at the screen of the etch a sketch and you can see it's got that like crystally looking sand inside like, of yep. it? Well, if you get it in the bright light, you know, you move it, it's kind of shimmery. Mm-hmm. I looked up at her and she had that shimmery look in front of her. And she went from being 47, 46 year old to being about an 18 or 20 year old version of herself. Bare ass naked. Hair longer, covering her boobs, not a stitch of clothing on. And I was, my jaw hit the ground. I was like, I lost my words. I had, I couldn't say anything. And then just like that happened, I saw that shimmery, sandy looking glittery. And it it wasn't like really obvious sparkles. Not like, you know, like on the, when they energize somebody on the, on Star Trek, it wasn't like that, but it was, it was, it was there. And she went back to being 47 and had her leather coat on and her blue jeans and I, I was just looking at her and she, she leaned forward across the edge of the bed and she's like, what's the matter, hon? What did you see? And I was like, I didn't say I said, I didn't say I saw anything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm leaving, bro. <laughs> um, you know, and I was like, I'm I'm grappling now with like what I just saw because I saw her a young girl naked. I mean, Uh not too young, but young compared to her age. At this point, I just want to get out of there. I'm still reeling from the, the noise. And now this happens and she gets up. I grab my, my suitcase and my box and my bag. And uh, real matter of factly, she just says, you know, I got somebody I think would be a really good fit for your show. And I was like, oh, yeah, really? I said, yeah, I'd love to put, put him in touch with me. And she goes, yeah, oddly enough, his name's Eric, too. And I stopped and I put my stuff down and I said, Eric for Nor? And she said, yeah, oh, my God, how did you know? 
I said, I didn't know. I said, how would you know? And she's like, I don't understand. My very first interview was with a demonologist out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Mm -hmm. At the end of that, at, at the end of that episode, after we were done recording, he said, Hey, this is going to sound really weird because like one of my best friends is a priest in the church of Satan in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. And he's like, he's a very good talker. And I think it'd be really interesting for you to have on your show. And I was like, uh, okay. And I said, what's his name? And he said, well, he has a pen name that he goes by Corvus Nocturnum. Uh -huh. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Uh, he says his, his real name is Eric Vernor. And he says, you can get a hold of him on Facebook. He's like, he's got a profile for both names. He's like, Corvus is the one he writes under. And then Eric is his, his regular one. He's like, message him, tell him that I sent you. And he says, I'll, I'll try to reach out and, and let him know that you're going to get a hold of him. He said, it'd be a really good conversation being that you're Catholic born and raised and he's the priest in the church of Satan. So that was probably two months. I never made it apparent that I was looking for this guy. I never talked about it on an episode. Uh, all I was trying to do was reach this guy through Facebook, which was the only two ways I knew how to get a hold of him was through either one of his profiles. And I had messaged him two or three times on uh, both, and he had never re responded to me. So for her to pull that name out of her ass, out of clear blue sky, I was like, that's weird. That that is weird. And she says, I'll 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 send him a message. He'll you'll hear from him in the next couple of days. Sure enough, I got a message from him. He was like, Hey, my friend or my friend uh, um Susan sent me a message, said that and subsequently I wound up with the interview. Uh really interesting guy. Don't know that I believed a word that he said, because if that's the team you're on, why would you be honest about anything, right? So um, so I get home. Well, I take that back. I leave the house. I'm putting my stuff in the back seat next to the big bag of dog food. She stands at the front of the car. She's looking out at the back part of her property, which is all wooded the opposite side of where that sound came from. Okay. And she looks back there and, you know, in, in the light of the, what moon was out there, you could see that the back of her property kind of dipped down and then it went up a big hill on in the backside. Apparently there's a, a bit of a river, small, bigger than a creek that runs back behind there. Um, and again, she goes, Ooh. and within like five seconds, I hear a whoop come back from like what would be the high area behind her. And then I hear another one off to the off to the right of me that seemed like it was two or three times as far away. Okay. And she turned back at me and she looked and she had this smile on her face and she goes, isn't that cool? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and she goes, I probably ought to put some food out for them tonight. They like to come take food off of the, the back deck. And I'm like, you feed them. And she's like, yeah, she's like that first place that I took you by the guardrail. She's like, if you walk back there, there's a tree log that's kind of got a worn, almost like a seat worn into it. And she says, I'll go out there. I think that's where they sit. And I'll go out there and I'll take, um, you know, like treats or, you know, hostess ho-hos or a jar of wow. peanut butter or something for them and, and leave them out there. And she says, then they, they come and take, you know, scraps off the, off the back of the deck too. And I, at this point, I was just like, all I wanted to do was get in the car and call my son. Get away. Right. I, I just wanted, now the road to her, the, this house was very, a lot of S curves and twisting and winding for about three, four miles, maybe five miles. And then it kind of straightened out. When I pulled out of her driveway and started going down through those S curves, I, it was dark. I would not turn my bright lights on because I did not want to see fucking eye shine coming out from the, the tree line along the road. I knew, I knew that if I hit my bright lights, 
that I was going to see ice looking out at me. I knew it. So I call my that son. I saw my son. I call my son and I said, dude, I said, I got like a 35 minute drive home. I said, you need to fucking talk me down because I don't know what the fuck that I just went through. And he's, he's laughing and he's, I'm like, no dude, I'm serious. This was three hours of the weirdest fucking time of my life. And he said, uh, he's like, what, why, what's going on? And so I, I told him, you know, about the ghost hand and then, but I really focused on, because he's a, he's big into the Bigfoot, uh, topic as well. And so I started telling him about that noise and he's like asking me questions. He's like, well, what did it sound like? Was it a whoop? Was it a howl? Was it a scream? Was it a this? Was it a that? Was it a this? What is it a that? And, you know, he was, he was rapid firing questions at me and I really could not, I couldn't grasp how to explain it to him. So it kind of pissed me off and I was like, fuck, dude, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but all I know is it was so loud that it filled that room. And I said, my recording equipment was on. I know damn well when I get home and I put this on, I, I captured it. I know damn well I did. And he's like, well, man, as soon as you get that done, he's like, send it to me. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. So I got home. I, it was by this time, you know, it was probably around 11 o'clock. I had to work the next day, but I didn't care. I, want, I just, I wanted to get that audio on. So I found it and all you hear after she says the word and all you hear is this little, I mean, the softest, slightest little, like almost like a hoot owl, you know, like, a, what? and I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I must have the wrong, I must have the wrong, uh, spot. So I kept playing it and sure enough, there's the, on, on the waveform. So, you know, I go back five minutes. I knew it wasn't that long, but I go back five minutes and all you hear is this tiny, tiny little woo. And I knew it's the right place because all of a sudden there's silence. And then you hear her say, did you hear that? And I was like, hell yeah, I heard that. What the hell was that? And she's like, that was my big boy. That's SETI. So I knew I had the right spot. So then I isolated that. And I tried to run some filters to try to drown out any background. And I tried to, you know, elevate the levels of the volume for that. And I was able to do a little bit to it. But the really weird thing is when I got the audio and I created a little audio clip of it and I put it on my phone so I could send it to my son and send it to some other people and say, you know, what do you make out of this? If you listen to it, like up to your ear, you can't hardly hear it. But I gave it to my friend who was standing 15 feet of me uh, on the other side of a room and uh -huh. he was playing it on my phone and I could hear it clear as a bell. Yeah, that's backwards. You know, it didn't make any sense. And I was like, so, you know, there were three, four days. I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the, the, the hair standing up and how it came in waves and, I'm like, I, I don't understand. And then all of a sudden it hit me that I was like, you know, you hear people talk about being in around Bigfoot and they they get zapped. Yep. And I was like, holy shit. I always thought zapped was kind of like a generic term for, I don't know what to call this. But when it hit me that what I felt was, was an electrical wave. Yep. That hit me and then it dissipated and it came back, but it wasn't as strong. And then it dissipated and it came back, but it wasn't as strong as the time before. And I was like, holy shit, I got fucking zapped. That's what they're talking about. That was infrasonic. And I was like, it was a revelation to me. And I called my son and I'm like, dude, I, it, this is what it is. And he, you know, he's, a geologist he's a scientist so as much as he likes to hear these things and believes you know to some extent he's still skeptical and has the science brain and all that and he's like well it could have been could have been could have been could have been and uh i was just like i couldn't send it to enough people and i'm like play it really close to you and then play it and walk way away from it and see if you can hear it and like three other people said man i can hear it better when i'm really far away from it and that is a, 
component to infrasound. Um, so, you know, that was, that was eye opening and that was crazy. Um, but then that, that whole thing with like that, that animal magnetism and it was a glamour know, spell. Seeing it was like glamour. Exactly. And that, you know, so I ended up calling her, I, I sent her a message and I said, Hey, do you have a few minutes for a phone call? And she said, sure. So I called her and she goes, what's the matter is, I mean, is the recording, did something go wrong or, and I was like, no, 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 everything's fine. I said, but I said, you know, there at the end of the night, when you asked me what's the matter, hon, what did you see? And I said, you know, I, I lied to you. I said, I, I told you I, I didn't see anything, but I, I did see something. And she goes, well, what did you see? And I said, exactly what I told you. I said, I saw you change into a 18 or 20 year old version of yourself, bare ass naked hair, just barely covering your breasts, sitting in the same position on the edge of your bed, looking straight at me. I said, I saw a shimmery kind of ish thing come over the, you know, the front of you. And the next thing I knew you're sitting there bare ass naked as a 20 year old kid. And I said, I'll tell you this. And I, I said, I, I promise you, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I said, there was some insane, um, physical attraction to you. And I said, no disrespect intended, but you are not my type. You're not in my wheelhouse of who I would be attracted to, you know? So I don't understand. I'm not like that. It's, that's not something that I, you know, I'm not a predator. I don't, I don't look right. at women in that, in that way. I said, did you do that to me? And she goes, no, I didn't. And I said, if you did, would you tell me? And she's, she kind of skirted that, but she said, maybe it was my, um, maybe it was my spirit guides. And I said, to what end? And she said, did you ever see a wolf? And I said, no. She goes, because I have a dog man that's a, a spirit guide. And I said, no, I did not see that. I said, I saw you change into a 20-year-old version of you naked. And she said, eh, might have been the spirit guides. And I said, but uh, explain to me what to what end. Well, I mean, why? For why why would they she... need to show you naked? And she said, I don't know. Maybe they were testing your... Um, what was intention. the word? Yes, your intention. Maybe they were testing your intention. And I was like, what in the fuck? And she's like, well, maybe it was, maybe it was a little bit of leftover because uh, not too long ago, me and my niece and some other ladies went to a bar and I did a Aphrodite spell on us. And she said, Everybody in that bar, man, woman, child, everyone was hitting on us. So. No, I don't know what to tell you, brother. That's wild. <laughs> All right, man, we ran out of time on that. And I tell you what, let's do this. Um, we were supposed to be talking about some of these things throughout the interview, but we didn't hit them. All right, so how do we get people to tune into the podcast? Where can they find it? And... Um, what days does it drop? And I need to know that so I can promote it. Okay. Uh, Uncomfortable Podcast airs every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern. It's on Spotify, Apple, any of the major platforms that carry audio podcasts. You can find it there. Um, there are some other Uncomfortable Podcasts. So if you search Uncomfortable Eric, E-R-I-C-K, you will see this... Uh, this logo that has a lowercase U and an uppercase N with the word comfortable underneath it. That's my logo. Um, like I said, I got about 130 episodes out just recently in the past, uh, let's say two, two and a half months, I've started doing the video with the, uh, the audio podcast as well. So those are being released to the uncomfortable podcast channel on YouTube. And, uh, Right now, all my episodes are also available on Red Circle. 
All right, I'm going to show everybody their logo so they can see it. This is the logo, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, sir. This one right here. Right there. Don't be going and click the wrong podcast. Yeah, please. Click this one. <laughs> Man, don't click the wrong podcast, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let me stop sharing that. Um, the other thing I'd like to cover, if you don't mind, uh, this uh, this September 14th, I will be hosting the Bigfoot and Brews. That is going to be the third year that I've hosted this. It is Brews as in beer? Brews going to see as, drinking beer? Yep, yep. It is held at Sister Lakes Brewing Company in Dowajak, Michigan. Uh, it, it, it has the uh, distinction of being the home of the 1964 Dewey Lake monster sightings. There was, uh, I believe the first sighting was uh, June 3rd of 1964. Uh, there were several sightings throughout that summer uh, in that, in that uh, cottage rental lake area. There's uh, several lakes in a very small span of area. And uh, so we come there. I have uh, speakers this year will be Amy Boo from the Olympic Project and from Project Zoo Book. Uh, I've got Scott Tompkins, who's going to be speaking. It's his first speaking engagement ever. I'm bringing him up from Texas. He's from the Bigfoot Mapping Project. I've got a, a number of other speakers as well as we're going to round out the day by adding a little bit of paranormal to the uh, to the Bigfoot topic. And we're calling this year, we're calling it Bigfoot and Brews and Spirits too. So... No, then also, not. also no date as of yet. Uh, Bigfoot and Brews and Spirits Two will be September fourteenth. I'll be announcing on my podcast uh, probably within the week that tickets will be uh, on sale through Eventbrite for that. And uh, later on in October, I'll be hosting the second annual Forty and Airwaves, which uh, we did last October in uh, Ada, Ohio. And that is literally five to six live podcasts taking place on a stage in front of a live audience. And uh, last year was, uh, you know, it was starting from the ground up. We had uh, we had a decent turnout, and it was it was a lot of fun. It was good to good to meet some of the guys that are in the realm of what we're doing, and uh, everybody had a really good time. We all had uh, our shirts and whatever for sale, but. Uh, a lot of really, really good reviews about uh, 40 and Airwaves, so we're looking forward to doing that again as well. All right, gotcha. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the one and only James Williams Dark Waters, and I'm out of here with Uncomfortable Eric. I'm telling you guys, this has been a phenomenal conversation, so I want you to head on over, take a listen to the podcast. Now, I want to say this to all you lurkers in the chat that are going to be lurking over the next 30, 60, 90 days. I know you guys are going to be there hitting the like button, but also Hope, open up another screen on your phone and go ahead and uh, find the podcast on your phone. I'm putting this in a recording 